Gus, good afternoon to you there over in London. Good afternoon, Glenn. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, it's so good to see you. So good to see you. And I guess this is a, a happy week to be bringing you onto the program because you've just been letting us know that the VNA is in the process of reopening. Exactly, exactly. And, and this period, uh, for a museum, it is all about the public. And this period, although it's been useful for us in giving us time to think about the future, we really miss the public. So this is a really great week for us to re-engage with the people who really matter. Yeah, yeah, that's great to hear. Um, so we're going to be looking into the uh, near future of the VNA and particularly VNA East. Super exciting. I thought maybe we could start with uh, a little bit of your own background, though, which is uh, so interesting. Um, you obviously come from a fascinating historic family um, and have many relatives in the arts and other areas. Um, of enterprise, but then you've also had a very distinguished career as a broadcaster, as a historian, um, and a uh, consultant and curator of exhibitions, and then also as a director of the Smithsonian. So I wonder if you could just give us a couple of the kind of recent highlights before we got to the VNA, or you got to the VNA, and let us know a little bit about your trajectory. I, I've just been incredibly lucky, and um, that's all it is. That's all I can put it down to. That for me. Um, the highlights, I mean, I've lo I loved my previous role working at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art mm. with one of the great teams as well. You know, that these are some of the most generous and talented people that I've ever worked with. And um, it's an institution set up 1964 in that kind of moment of, of transition, but not just for, for, for America, but also for Africa. Mm -hmm. And there was the creation of this new museum that wanted to try to reconfigure um, American, America's understanding, um, not just about Africa, but also for African Americans about their heritage, but to do so through great African art and it has built one of the great collections and has around it a fantastic network of staff and friends and, and just as a place that it just is one of those spaces that you just feel completely recharged by every time you go and I felt incredibly privileged to work there but the idea of in any way leading that institution I, I, I never felt <laughs> Um, in any way like I, I, I had the qualifications to do so because the staff are just so uh, are just so exceptional and then to go from that to my present role which uh, is another dream role and um, I just feel deeply privileged I've, I've been extremely lucky and uh, um, you know I, I feel very blessed and this present role equally exciting and I can't wait to to, to, to tell you some more about it. Well, you know, I, I guess I did want to ask you about, um, of course, we'll get to the expansion project, VNA East, in a second. But before we leave the topic of African art and design, of course, you have a PhD from SOAS in this topic yourself. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, of course, will not have um, been new to you at all when you were at the Smithsonian. Of course, there was also the amazing development of David Atche's African American Museum. Yes. To be confused with the Museum for African Art um, and other Smithsonian institutions. So that was happening at the time that you were there. And now you've come to the VNA, which historically has not collected African art and design. And in fact, one could make a strong case that that um, exception is itself a legacy of colonial era Victorian preferences as to what counted as elite art that should be imitated and learned from and what should not. And I wonder how you've wrestled with that particular problem in making the institutional shift. But we, we say that I, I'm, I'm going to um, be working in an institution that we are going to be a collection center as well as a museum. And the collection center holds a quarter of a million objects and they tell the story of humankind and they tell the story of Africa as well. And they do it very well. We have great work from ancient Egypt, 5,000 years um, of history, but also we have incredible Yinka Shonabare. So mm. even within the context of that vast collection, we probably can't tell it the story of Africa as well as we could tell the story of parts of, uh, of South and Southeast Asia, but we can tell it really, really robustly. And 
Mm. I am really determined that over the course of my tenure that we will build build the African collection within the v and and that I've already got my eye on one or two things that I want to, to see us um, uh, loan and acquire over the, the, the short term. Um, but over the medium term, I want us to begin to build a real strategy to define the v as being one of the key centres for the, the collection and for the, um, the, the, the display and research of African art. Mm. I remember when I was there at the v in the research department, um, that was several years ago now, almost 10 years ago, and there was a fascinating project that was really about excavating the African art that was in the collection and often hadn't even been identified as such or simply had been, you know, um, off the radar, sort of fit of absence of mind kind of thing. And it is amazing that although the museum spent so many years not explicitly setting up to collect African art, that actually a lot, including textiles particularly, but other types of objects as well, had been collected. So you are building from, from some strength there. Exactly. I mean, in the textile area that, you know, uh, African textiles, but also textiles that were exported to, you know, those glorious wax print textiles that came via, you know, the, uh, Britain, Holland, um, you know, Southeast Asia, into Africa and that they become the textile from the sort of 1950s all the way up to the present that define whole areas of, of fashion for an awful lot of particularly West Africa. Mm -hmm. And there is a wonderful collection of those and they are works that take me back to my own childhood and to my first visits to West Africa that were seen through a veil of these glorious fabrics. And so as, as, as a repository, it tells the story of humankind, but there is this glorious seam that runs through it from the very oldest object in the collection, the you know, Egyptian piece, all the way through to some of the things that we're going to be collecting in the future. So I want to be someone who draws the connections across time and across continental Africa that really begin to allow our visitors to focus down on how the VNA represents the world in terms of its collection, its collection and its ambitions to collect. And I think that is something which uh, I really look forward to. Can I just ask one last question about this because it's such an important Please. topic uh, and you know so much about it. I wonder how the VNA um, will distinguish itself from the British Museum and to a, a, an extent also the British Library. I know you've had a lot to do with uh, the representation of African art and history at both of those institutions. So do you think that the V&A has an opportunity by virtue perhaps of its focus on art design and performance to tell a different story about Africa than the other major uh, nationals in, in London? Yeah, and uh, it's not just a different story, but a different kind of contextualization as well. And um, you know, my, my brother, who sadly I lost quite recently, but he was a designer and he really helped me to think about, you know, African fashion design and how it is underpinned by this huge complex network of, of understanding of how it fix, it's rooted both within, within Africa and also globally. And mm. I think it's that particular way of thinking about design, thinking about um, um, African textile, thinking about sort of narrative, but being able to layer it up with all of the different areas of disciplinary focus that the V&A can uniquely bring together. That, as you say, it is, it is performance, it is kind of design, it is architecture. So you can offer a kind of contextualization which is pretty much unique and we, with particularly our new proposition down in East London, that we have a kind of facility which allows us to do that in ways that very few museums around the world have ever been able to do before. Yeah, um, I'm really glad you mentioned your brother, Joe, um, who very sadly passed away last year. And I know his son, Charlie, is carrying on in his, um, in his stead as a fashion designer. Um, just before we get, and this will be the last question before I, we start looking at those images um, to give people a sense of what VNAs will look like. I just wanted to know something about your own relationship to fashion. Um, 
I assume it must have been around you growing up, given your. <laughs> <Basically. Yeah. laughs> <laughs> we have a rule about Zoom: no, no commentary, no judgment on Zoom attire. <laughs> but um, the, I wonder about that particularly because fashion has been such a strong draw for the VNA yeah. and such a, an incredibly important card in its deck, and presumably will be a big part of what happens at VNA East too. So, what are your thoughts about fashion as a discipline and how it fits into the mix of the museum's uh, personality? Well, it's pretty key. And cool. I mean, I have worked in in television had made films on, on many, many visual artists, but I've also made lots of films on fashion designers, you know, on um, Julia McDonald and Karl Lagerfeld and Alexander McQueen. And, you know, it's one of the things that has driven me across the course of my career. My very earliest memories of, are of watching my brother draw and just seeing how a kind of, a particular sort of, creative alchemy was possible just with a pencil and a piece of paper and how and then watching those those designs then become something that was three-dimensional that could be practical and there is something that is magical about fashion and then the idea that we can all acquire it that we can walk around with this art actually it can protect us from the the, the elements it can protect us from you know, for, for, from from um, from the world in terms of the sorts of relationships we want to lead. It, it's fashion that leads. It leads when we walk into a room. That's how we're going to be judged. So, for me, I think it is the most kind of expressive form of 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 uh, of, of vis visual practice. In that, the actual owner becomes part of its animation. And so, I I love that, and I want to as part of my tenure to make sure that what we do with fashion because so often one reads about fashion and it is trivialized by the commentary that it is the sort of thing that you particularly now you can buy fairly good clothes incredibly cheaply and then you know we wear them and then we dispose of them but the thought that goes into into the selection of fabrics into the into the the cutting of those fabrics into the crafting of those designs is so great that i want to give designers the deserved platform so we can actually begin to unravel some of that you speak to some of the great designers and they are as thoughtful as many artists in the, the way in which they research and they pull themes together the way in which they synthesize different um uh different design motifs and bring together a kind of a fusion of different sorts of influences that we can just wear in the in a way that feels in a way that feels so natural mm. i i think it is a truly underrated art form that deserves to have um greater scrutiny from an academic and from um Topological point of view, and I want to be there to give it that. Mm. I suppose one of the great things the VNA can do too is to contextualize what you might call modern and contemporary fashion in relation to historic dress, and the VNA can do that maybe better than any other museum. Um, you mentioned something there that I wanted to just ask you a little more about, which is the question about sustainability, because mm -hmm. I know that's perhaps the most pressing question facing fashion, as with so many other sectors of the creative industries now and fashion perhaps has a particular uh cross to bear and responsibility in terms of the impact that it's had on the environment everything from water usage when growing cotton to the waste of trainers when they're you know uh, no longer in fashion or thrown away and put in a landfill do you feel that the vna is um taking a proactive role and stance with respect to narrative of sustainability in fashion particularly or more broadly? Is that something you see as within the museum's remit? Well, I, I, I see our, particularly East, our new institution as being founded around some fairly fundamental pr principles and equity, sustainability, have to be kind of key and core to everything that we think about and deliver. And mm -hmm. I think as for, for any institution, particularly one which is being created now, that 
you can't really go forward without actually thinking about your responsibility to to others and whether they are others who are within the communities that surround your institution or people on the other side of the earth who are in some way paying the price for 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 the privilege of you being able to do what you do that we have to think in ways that are responsible holistically to that wide canvas of different sorts of communities which are who are touched by what we do and so absolutely we will be thinking about what our footprint is and how we actually impact the communities around and beyond so that we do not actually kind of have um, a detrimental impact on the worlds around us so we are thinking absolutely from this very early stage of conception how we become a truly sustainable institution. Hmm. I guess that um, does bring us very neatly to the building itself because it has to start there, doesn't it? The way that you approach that architecturally speaking. Uh, so let's just look at a few images um, that you've been kind enough to share with us. Um, and uh, this is nothing secret. <laughs> There's a, these are, have been uh, fairly widely um, shown, but first maybe you could talk a little bit about the site uh, the Olympic Parks, former Olympic uh, Park site, and how the v &A is going to fit into that milieu. And well, this, this is a part of London. I don't know, um, I'm sure many of you have visited, um, um, but it's an interesting, I mean, in, in, in the 1850s, at the time of the Great Exhibition, and the v &A is an institution which comes into being in the 1850s when um, Prince Albert, um, but also Henry Cole, who was this sort of pioneer of design, get together and they want to create a moment in which there is both an, an acknowledgement of the incredible, um, the incredible creative um, practice that exists in Britain, but also to empower a new generation with, with skills. And Henry Cole, he is a kind of a strange guy who is incredibly single-minded but also very generous and visionary and he goes to Paris to see one of the great um, uh, um, design fairs in which is going on in Europe in that period and he wanders around and everyone else is, seems to be enjoying it thoroughly but he goes around and he is totally unimpressed you could imagine him sort of being incredibly grumpy and and, and upset by everything he's seen. And he comes home and says, how could they have done that? They've created this incredible exposition, which they claim to be, you know, a, a, um, a platform for the greatest design that the, the world's ever seen. And yet it's only European designers. He says, let's create an exposition, a moment of celebration in which we bring together people from all over the world. And so he, designs this moment of the great exhibition which was meant to be a crucible for for global design and art you know the very best of creativity from all around the world and something like thirty thousand foreign nationals come to london um, for that the, the, the first few weeks of uh, of the great exhibition and it is a great success and um it gives rise to the movement which develops into the V&A. And um, that underlying spiritual DNA of wanting to create practice which is global, but then at the same time, which is based and driven by celebrating also the diversity of local practice is something which has really inspired me and our team. And we want to, in this bit of London, which is one of the most creative bits of London and one of the most diverse bits of London, to be able to deliver a proposition which does something similar. And so this area, which was, as you can see in the far distance of this slide, you can see um, what is now actually um, West Ham um, Football Club, but, is, but was, um, um, at the time of the previous Olympics, it was the Olympic Stadium. And around it, are, it is surrounded by a huge number of buildings that actually supported the, the, the Olympics. And also a lot of empty land. And so we have 
thankfully been given both this space here, um, which we are going to um, use as our collection centre, which is a var it's a football stadium sized space into which we are going to um, bring 250,000 objects from our collection, which will, were previously stored in West London. And they're going to come here into East London. But it's going to be a, like a collection centre unlike any other, in that it's going to be open access so that you can come in and you can look at vast amounts of it. And it's, it's a glorious um, building which has been converted by um, Elizabeth Diller, the, the, the practice, and they've created something which is unlike any collection centre I've ever seen before. We can go back to... Uh, to this. Oh, no, no, that's, that's okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, so this, yeah. yeah, so this is, this is what it looks like from the inside, so that you can... They've, they've actually taken this existing building. At, at this very moment, they're cutting through these floors, which are solid concrete, and actually allowing one for the very first time to be able to look down from um, these suspended floors down through the building. And so they deliver us this kind of space which is like a, a, um, a case in a museum but which is open and it actually allows us to not just see the space but to also see the, pa the packing cases which store these 250,000 objects that surround these, these walkways. Mm -hmm. And we've, what we've created is a kind of extension to that proposition, because the packing cases themselves, we are going to leave open where they are, they interface the actual um, passageways, so that as you walk through, you'll be able to see gain exposure to a vast array of, 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 of of our collection. It's, it's a really kind of compelling way of storing objects, but at the same time being able to tell stories that would otherwise be totally unaccessible. I love the idea that the visitor is inside the exhibition case. It's like a grand single case that you sort of float around inside of. And I suppose one of the key uh, themes or conceptual leitmotifs of the project must be transparency, right? The ability to see. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit more about that idea. So, so there are, there will be glass balustrades. In this rendering, you, they they actually don't look glass, but the balustrades are all glass. The actual floor itself, in that central, in that central space, um, is glass, and so you can actually look down onto the cases on the ground floor. Um, so, all the way through, it is about an openness and a transparency. Most of the cases, as I said, that interface the walkways, they will be open. And so that you can actually see, so everything is about you'll be about being able to look through and to gain a perception of of the vast diversity and complexity, but also accessibility of this collection, mm -hmm. um, so that you can engage with it in a variety of different ways. It's going to be a space which is going to be awe inspiring, but also at the same time that there are intimate spaces that you can get away, that you can spend time with particular objects, that you can walk down many of these sorts of corridors and look at things in, you know, spend real time with things. And we're hoping that this is gonna be a collection center, which is the sort of space that you're going to want to come in and investigate and feel that you can actually discover work rather than it being just presented to you, that it's going to be a space in which you can kind of initiate a kind of uh, um, inquiry. It's, so it's, it's normal, enormously exciting. And we're just beginning to think about the sorts of objects that we're going to have um, uh, 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 actually exposed in the open cases, thinking about which of the objects that you'll be able to see. Because even as you look down, you can see the glass floor. We will even have objects which are sitting on the very top of the cases beneath, so that you could, even as you look down, that is going to be a kind of an, an, an interface into further opportunities to interact with the collection. So all around you, you're going to be surrounded, sort of almost like a matrix style by the collection. Yeah. It's going to be unlike anything you've ever seen before, but I think 
immediately you enter, whether you be a child or an experienced practitioner, you're going to understand from the architecture and from the way in which the work is configured around you exactly what a collection centre is and exactly what you might draw from it. You know, it's so interesting you mentioned the matrix because I was just thinking that there's also a sense in which this is um, like taking an online collection or even a Google image search and in a way embodying it as a physical reality, like this kind of incredible availability of information to you. And I, I wonder um, whether you think that, you know, historians of the future will look at this as an, a museum that expresses our own digital moment in some sense because of well, that idea of information flow. I, li I like that idea, but I also think what, what is incumbent on us is to extend the interpretive possibilities through the digital as well. And I like the idea of us engaging with the audiences by introducing them to particular objects, but that for them to further be able to expand the interpretive possibilities by them offering their own layers that will sit on top of the things which have been posited by curators and experts and begin to build dialogues that may well interface with other visitors who are there or with people who may never visit but who have some connection to the object so that we can build around this a kind of further open and accessible space which is digital so both the, the building feels open and accessible the cases are open and accessible but also around us is this space in which there is a, a kind of digital interface which is continually being reiterated and which is completely open and feels de democratic and I, I feel for someone particularly who's grown up with West African aunts who would come and they would constantly be telling us amazing stories about objects that uh, um, were were precious to our families that there is a kind of a way in which that speaks to something which is really important to a lot of communities that objects become a kind of point of convergence for families for narrative for communities so rather than objects being you know a, a kind of um a sort of academic dead end a, a place at which there is only opportunity for mediation between an expert and a visitor that this is something which is far more dynamic and three-dimensional in which there can be multiple layers of interpretation many of them contradictory many of them personal but none of them wrong you know <laughs> there's a way in which we could all interrelate and we can contradict and it, there's a kind of dynamic presence that sits in and around the space so that I'm hoping is a kind of an analog for what the space looks like itself. It is open, but it is also at the same time full of voices and possibilities. Mm, that's so fascinating. I guess it prompts one last question about this before you get onto the Viennese Museum, which is the thing we're seeing on the left, um, different building. But um, I wonder what your thoughts are on that crowdsourced element and that three-dimensionality of information and ideas and associations or, that are built around the objects. What's the relationship between that and the expertise of the staff at the museum? Because of course the V&A, again, is an unexceeded in terms of its yeah. um, in-house knowledge, thinking both about curators and conservators, and of course many other uh, parts of the museum as well, have just such extraordinary depths of uh, insight about these objects. Do you feel like the v storehouse also gives them a platform for speaking differently to the public from their own expert position? Absolutely, and one looks at this as, as a metaphor and they will be like the, the, the sort of, the crystal of salt which is dropped into, into the saline water, that it, around it it's going to build a whole constellation of other crystals, but it, that is the point, the anchoring point, that is the, the, the catalyst for everything that builds around it and is supported by it. And I think that is, that is the way in which we respect knowledge, that we expect, respect learning and understanding, and that we reinvest in it. But at the same time, that interpretive possibilities of 
many of the objects in the VNA is extended when we think about how they might well have been used and loved. You know, that we all have things in our home which may appear on the surface of it to not be worth a great deal, but they are worth a huge amount to us. And the, the way in which we can convey that value is through narrative. And that I want those narrative layers to enhance our visitors' understanding of the objects in our collection so that they may well be the sorts of things that can be understood through really rigorous academic um, interpretation. But simultaneously, they may well be objects which can be further enhanced through our understanding of how they might have been loved, how they might have been used almost to the point of, ex of extinction by their owners. And the sorts of things that they may have been used for and ways in which they would have changed lives, the ways in which, you know, that they would have impacted the young and the old. You know, those are the things I think which could be really deeply powerful, I think, in particularly engaging with objects that may be from cultures that we don't have immediate um, connection to. I think that could be very powerful. I, I love the idea of um, objects, or artifacts from the past being loved into extinction. <laughs> That's the very, uh, very evocative uh, way of describing the kind of artifactual loss that we're often combating as historians. Well, let, let's talk about the VNA East Museum, which is the, we're seeing the facade of it on the left um, by O'Donnell and Toomey, the Irish architects. Um, and speaking of crystalline structures, here's another one. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this uh, separate venue and what it will be used for, the vision there? So this, this is um, a museum in a more conventional sense. Um, and as you say, O'Donnell and Toomey, a beautiful building, which um, was actually um, inspired by a, a, a Balenciaga dress. Um, and, you know, you can see these beautiful sort of geometric forms, but it, it, you can understand how it was driven in its conception by the idea of flowing fabric. And um, it's a building on four floors within which we want to, um, we want to have exhibitions, but we want it to be a kind of um, exhibition interface which will speak to the local population. You know, that for many, this is one of the most diverse parts of, of, of London, you know, ethnic majorities in all of the surrounding boroughs, um, but also, you know, an area which has given us some of the most um, um, talented artists in, 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 in Britain. And we want those people to feel like this isn't, you know, something which has landed from out of the space, but it's an institution that doesn't just welcome them, but it feels like it belongs to them, that it reflects their loves and their interests. And um, speaks to them in ways that aren't patronizing um, and that, you know, becomes a nurturing in, in environment for their, their, their talents. And so um, it's a space that you'll come into has three um, um, conventional exhibition um, floors, but also on the top, a floor which we want to be kind of like um, an engine of new kinds of possibility where we'll engage in partnerships with a variety of different kinds of 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 of, uh, of creatives but also um, companies and institutions so that they might come and do a period of residence and actually be doing to be creating their practice on site mm. um, it's it's going to be a, re a building that you're going to want to come and see both for the architecture but I think also the sorts of things that we're going to be doing within are going to not be the sorts of conventional um, propositions that you see in, in, in most museums. So I'm really excited by it as a, as, as a kind of counterpoint to what's happening at the Collection Centre, a space in which we'll animate many of the narratives that you'll see there. Both spaces will be connected by this celebration of of making and that is that goes back to the henry cole drive that mm. making was 
what um, he felt that Britain did incredibly well. And we want both spaces to be crucibles in which we examine making one, the history, this space, thinking about active, animating, making, you know, that is happening around us very often through the practitioners themselves. Mm. So revivifying that Victorian idea of the workshop of the world. In, in a exactly. Way. Yeah. exactly. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about the larger context? Um, I was uh, going to ask you maybe to talk about this in a somewhat political context also, because I know that there has been a lot of contestation around the Olympic site over the years. I remember when I lived there, you could see in Hackney, the neighborhood, you know, working class neighborhood, um, and very art focused neighborhood that adjoins the Olympic Park. People used to walk around with buttons that said to keep Hackney crap. <laughs> in other words, don't, don't destroy the character of this place. And, and I wonder um, how the V&A is navigating the shoals of the larger world around these two um, new institutional projects and, and how you actually are thinking about ensuring the community feels ownership over this initiative. Well, as I said, that this is, this is a campus which is surrounded by some of um, the most diverse, but also um, some of the most disadvantaged communities in Europe. And you know, I'm determined that they engage with this space and feel that it is something that they um, could be proud of. Um, and it is a kind of campus of, of opportunity that if, is, as you go along that you'll see our building, um, the, the, you know, the v &A, absolutely the most interesting architecturally in that. <laughs> But our, our building, and then adjacent to it, that that's UAL, which is um, University of the Arts London, and this is the London College of Fashion campus, um, which will house, um, I think, um, I think it's something like um, six or seven thousand students in this one campus, mm. um, and then adjacent um, is. The BBC, where um, there, this is going to be a performance and orchestra space, um, and then beyond um, Sadler's Wells, which is going to be a, a new um, theatre, and beyond that, if we cut, if we keep walking in the same direction, um, University College London is bringing a new campus as well, which will have. Um, uh, um, a variety of different sorts of disciplines, including robotics um, and architecture. And so that there is a kind of a campus of possibilities here, of, of a range of different kinds of cultural and creative pursuits. But those are all areas which in different ways speak to the practice, the practices that have always been in this part of East London. When, in the time when Henry Cole was defining his proposition for the original v and um, There was a punch writer, Henry Mayhew, who actually walks through this area and he describes it as a place of makers. He, he, he sees all of the sort of textile designers and the cobblers and the, 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 um, the weavers and he's utterly entranced by it. And he writes about, uh, writes about it at length. And then Charles Dickens, he follows him. And he again talks about this area as a place of makers. And it's always been that. This, has been, this was the place where Alexander McQueen went to art college, where people like Gerald Scarf, um, you know, would, 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 would also go to college. That it's always been this place that has had an inordinate number of, of deeply gifted and creative people. And yet we've never invested in the infrastructure to give them the platform to actually realize their dreams. This mm. is an opportunity for us to reinvest in those people who have basically been the engines, in the engine room of, of Britain's creative success. And so I can't think of a better place for us to have this. This is about facilitating the young in realizing their dreams and um, it will be as I see it a crucible of possibilities and so I you know I've spoken to 
um, many of the mayors of the local boroughs, and they are delighted with this as a proposition, that they have been campaigning for this sort of transformation in that area for generations. And it's time they were remembered, and that this gives them the, the, the platform on which they can begin to really realize their own dreams in ways that will be truly transformative. So I think it's the right proposition at the right time in absolutely the right place. Hmm. Let me um, just take the, if it's okay, I'll take the images down so we can see a little, a little bit better, Gus, if that's all right. Um, and I just want to ask you one more question before opening it up to the floor, because I know we have a few questions already, which is great. If you have questions for Gus, just put them in the chat box, please. Um, I just wanted to ask you maybe the obvious question of how recent events are affecting these plans. And I think it is very easy to see this as a kind of glittering bright spot in what is otherwise a very dark picture in many respects, uh, particularly because of the pandemic and its impact on the nation, both in terms of its health and its uh, eco economy. You also, of course, have the uncertainties being brought about by Brexit, that you're going to be sailing into that headwind, possibly. Mm -hmm. And I wonder um, how you, you yourself are coping with the upheavals that are happening around you as you're trying to kind of sail the ship into port. Well, I, again, I go back to Henry Cole. What he wanted to bring was the world to, to London and to offer London to the world. And I think about this moment now in which if we think about delivering sustainably, that the responsible thing for us to do is for us not to be as tra traveling as much as we once were. And I think both in terms of COVID, we're not, probably not wanting to travel as much as we once were. So we need to find ways of offering really thrilling interfaces that bring the very best of the world to populations that really feel like they, you know, that, that they can interface with those sorts of possibilities. So I feel that this is an opportunity for us to create a window on the very best of global practice in a part of the world which is deeply diverse. This is one of the most culturally diverse bits of Europe. And I think the two things that they fit together to create a kind of, um, of, of, of deeply synergistic dynamism that I think is going to be really right for, 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 for this generation that we create solutions which really speak to, to local populations and we do it in a way that does not impact either their potential to, to, to reach the stars or for us to undermine future generations' um, 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 lives. So I think it's the right proposition. Huh. So do you, um, just following up on that, do you feel that be, partly because of the impact of the coronavirus um, crisis, that something you might have wanted to do anyway, which is really focus on local audiences and maybe increase the mix of the local as opposed to international tourist audiences. Do you think that that's become a more central part of the mission and strategy around the project is to focus on London audiences particularly? Um, I, th I think it was always important, but I think now, you know, that we're, we're going to be surrounded by, I don't know what, many thousands of students from both the UCL campus and also the London College of Fashion. When I remember being that age and every time there was a holiday, I would jet off to another part of the world, you know, just to suck in inspiration. And it may well be that for this generation, they don't feel that that is the appropriate thing to do. And if they don't, I celebrate them because it, it is difficult to see how we can tenably continue to do that um, in terms of the costs on the planet. But then we want to give them as much exposure to as thrilling things as we had as a generation. And so I think this is one of the ways in which we can, we can do that. And, um, and also for artists from across the world that we want to give them the platform right here in London to speak to, 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 to some of these really interesting dynamic young audiences. So I think it's a sort of a match made in heaven. 
Yeah, it really does remind you of the Great Exhibition and the idea of bringing the world to London at a time when a lot of people couldn't travel in those days, of course, long yeah. before air um, transit. So there are some fascinating historical resonances there. Um, well, if it's okay, Gus, I'd lo love to uh, go to a couple of questions Please. from the audience. And the first will actually come from a colleague of ours, Ethne Nightingale, oh, who yes. was part of that yeah. mentioned um, <laughs> project uh, identifying African works in the collection. Ethne, do you want to ask your question directly to Gus? We can unmute. Um, okay, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Can Perfect. you hear me? Okay. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. Hi. And welcome back, Gus. Thank you. Um, it, it's really, because uh, I was involved in that project, probably as you know, and covering objects of relation to the African diaspora. And although the VNA didn't officially collect at that time um, objects, um, we uncovered over 3,000. And at that time, Mark Jones committed to having a, a gallery in relation to the African diaspora. And I'm not sure if that's been put on hold or there was a commitment and to the funders, Heritage Lottery Fund. So I just wondered if you knew where the progress on that or whether that's been developed or shelved or whatever. I don't, I, I don't know the progress on that. I'm sorry, Ethne. But what I do know is that um, um, Tristram Hunt, the, the, the present director, has a real ambition to, em, em, to embrace... Um, Africa and the diaspora and to think of ways of us uh, um, building collection, building audiences, um, uh, but also that we can, we want to find ways of programmatically really delivering in that area. And one of the, one of the exhibitions I'm really excited to, to, to see develop is an exhibition that will look at African fashion. And that is, um, I think that will be delivered at some point over the next three years. It's uh, just looking at the initial proposals. It's going to be quite thrilling. I mean, just looking at the range of, 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 of works that have been identified as but for possible inclusion. It's, it's, it's very, very exciting. Mm, great. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Christina Panchik, which she's asked me to just read out. So she's isolating the distinction between ready-to-wear garments versus haute couture. Yes. Um, and asks, what audience are fashion designers creating for, and who is the community for fashion design? And I suppose, how does the v &A think about the different pitches on which fashion operates? And, and do you just try to do it all? Or how do you focus your energies in terms of building an audience for fashion, including, of course, the creative practitioners themselves? This is a great question, Christina. I, know, I, I one of my great memories of, of my 20s was spending the season um, that Alexander McQueen joined Givenchy with him and, um, uh, and following the development of that initial um, collection, just from a series of sketches to them walk being walked down the catwalk by Naomi Campbell and uh, you know it was one of the great privileges and the of, 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 of my life but what I came to recognize is that for McQueen you know someone who grew up in Newham that there was a kind of fundamental connection between the things that were happening in his mind that would end up with a couture result to the sorts of things that were ready to wear, that he, what he was driven by was by the idea of the integrity and the purity of the design and that he wanted his work to always be effective and he would go to almost limitless lengths to make sure that he could resolve things and to make them work, whether they were, whether they were kind of, you know, tiny design, um, um, decisions or whether they were huge and I think he's he's you know for me he's a sort of a, a sort of spiritual guide that we want to be able to tell the full story and to tell it with equal respect that it's I would love to be able to tell the story of of trainer designers you know uh, as in training shoes um, you know sportswear designers of of you know to, to actually look at the sorts of of clothes where which many of us wear most of the time mm -hmm. and 
yet the sorts of design decisions that are made in their development are as deeply thoughtful as the couture end. So I want to be able to ex experiment in finding ways of telling those stories in ways that speak to the sorts of people who wear those clothes as well. So we can do both and we can give both equal platforms and underpin them with equal um, uh, levels of, 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 of intellectual um, um, investigation. I think, I think that really is something that I think DNA East will, 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 will fight to do. That's really interesting because from a New York point of view, if I can editorialize briefly, what you're describing sounds like a kind of combination of what the Costume Institute at the Met does and what MoMA did in its exhibition items, which Paola Antonelli and her team curated, which was much more about, as you say, the trainer designers and more um, street, street wear, but also uh, ready to wear and just sort of mass produced clothes and really trying to bring that all into one holistic picture. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, let's take a question from another colleague, Elizabeth James, has a question about research facilities at the new uh, center. Elizabeth, do you want to join us directly? Okay, thank you very much. Hi, um, um, so I, I just love to, uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to hear Gus for the first time, in my case, talk about um, the very exciting developments that are upcoming in in DNA East. With regard to the collection centre, I'd love to hear whether you've had any um, any thoughts yet about the relationship between the type of engagement for a much larger public than we've ever had before for stored collections with the um, opportunities that there are for translating that into real in-depth study and research. There are going to be two archive study rooms um, among the collections there. Mm. Yeah, and th this is this is this for me. It's about democratization. So I, I want to see all kinds of people using the research facilities, but at the same time, that we will be in a campus of university and also um, London College of Fashion, both places where you can come and you can get a PhD and you can. You, you, you want to be underpinning that with really rigorous thinking. So it's about us having the facilities and the welcome to, to that whole ecology. And um, we have absolutely, in terms of our archives, more than 900 of them, um, you know, the, the absolute appetite and the facilities to be able to cater for large numbers of, 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 of researchers um, and so it absolutely it will be there for formal for formal um, research but simultaneously I would love it if it becomes a space in which um, you know a younger generation might come in and do some research in which potentially um, some areas of industry might want to come in and use it as well, that we could, we could find a kind of space in which there can be um, a handshake that is united around the celebration of creativity. If we could do that, so that from the very youngest age of sort of, you know, 10, 11, 12, that you might be doing independent research for your homework, but simultaneously you might be in a space in which someone is writing their PhD or doing some research for industry. I love the idea of this becoming a kind of democratized but open environment in which we're all striving for creative and research excellence. Mm, that's a beautiful vision. And again, it seems very um, appropriate to our moment when research is happening everywhere through online techniques and the kind of infrastructure and institutional boundaries and gatekeeping that used to be built around research as an activity seem to have fallen down. So it's really consistent with that kind of democratization, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And we, we should all be giving people opportunities and platforms to engage with educational um, opportunities. And I, I can think of myself as a, as a, you know, as a kind of slightly, um, you know, dull and introverted boy with no friends, but going to museums and uh, and and collecting and reading and you know something like this, the chance of getting into a space and feeling that sense of privileged access, but also knowing that that 
it's that other thing of knowing that this is your this is belongs to you that these are public collections and we are opening them up not just for those involved in tertiary education for those who have privileged access this is for everyone and it's the empowerment of the young the people who are going to transform the possibilities for future generations that is the really exciting thing for me yeah and by the way let's hear it for the dull introverts right <laughs> <laughs> uh, so a question from uh, dr esther smith schmidt she's asked a couple of questions actually maybe we can get her on the line directly esther are you out there mm. Maybe, maybe too, uh, maybe we have a technological hurdle there. Let me just ask, uh, she's asked a couple of interesting questions. I'll just focus on this one. She says, what about objects in context or interior design where objects are integrated? So when you have, for example, the fabric of a room as a, is installed in the British galleries. And she says, my question refers to the philosophy behind the exhibition going away from the old fashioned object in a glass case to objects being represented in context with both an aesthetic and a didactic perspective. So how do you think about that in relation to this project? We will find a balance and that there will, there will be spaces, the recreation of uh, ceilings, the outer mirror. Um, there, will be, there will be a number of spaces in which we will be able to display in the kind of context that was never previously possible, you know, work that has has for some generations been actually kind of uh, locked away and that is the beauty of this kind of open access collection center that there are spaces which will allow us to show you know textiles which are are vast you know many dozens of meters you know in in, in length and so that that is that that kind of possibility will i think both transform um the sorts of ways in which we can work with our collection, but I think also the sorts of story we can tell, because I think suddenly rather than things just being abstracted and being about material and history, suddenly you can begin to imagine what it was like to, to potentially see these kinds of textiles, these sorts of carvings, this sort of, uh, of, of interior environment as a user. It, mm -hmm. It, and that is the that is the sort of magical transformation that I want the space to be able to make. That rather than pressing yourself your nose against the glass and seeing these things as somehow academic and abstracted, it's about these being things that impact you in the way in which they did the very first people who saw them. That that is. A kind of level of engagement that I, I think that we will be able to almost uniquely offer and that sense of it being this open case within which you have been placed that you actually become part of that as well mm -hmm. I think that's inordinately exciting such a beautiful image um, let me in the interest of time I'm just going to read out one last question which comes from another colleague Tessa Murdoch um, great historian of Huguenot uh, crafts among other topics and she just asks about how VNA East will be engaging with successive waves of immigrants who contributed to, create, to the creative economy and in that part of London especially and she mentions of course the Huguenots but also Jewish and yeah. Bengali communities that have been there and um, I suppose that might be a good last question just because it brings us full circle to the question of how VNA East is engaging with the world and of course the world has come to London through successive waves of immigration for so long um, so what are your thoughts about that? Well it is it continues that Henry Cole vision that um, that London is a crucible through which you could read and understand and connect with the world and you know he hoped the great exhibition would be a kind of distillation of that and we want to continue that but in the 21st century and to do it in a way in which is compatible with Britain renegotiating its place post-Brexit, particularly with peoples of the Southern Hemisphere. So beginning to build relationships through um, a new kind of um, wave of, of understanding of, of a 21st century equity. And so if we can begin to build a space in which artists, in which creatives, in which designers, in which audiences can come and see themselves 
reflect it and see the things that inspire them kind of, uh, of, of nurtured and given a context that they respect. I would, you know, feel that we had really succeeded, that it's a place in which both the creative and the, and the audience can both feel that they can each equally come in and they can see, feel themselves realized. Because so often you go into a museum space and the idea is that you as an audience member, that you are somehow passive. But this is an idea of a space in which everyone who visits will in some way hopefully be impacted, but hopefully leave a little of themselves be behind so that they transform the space over time so that it grows and it becomes a kind of sum of that glorious area, but hopefully, particularly, a, a kind of a greater sum of, of the creative endeavours of, 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 of humankind. That was the ambition of Henry Cole, and I would love it if that was realised in the VNA East. Hmm, fantastic. What, a, what an inspiring vision. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I think we're gonna to have to draw to a close there, uh, Gus, and uh, I know you'll have many other demands on your time as well, so we really thank you for spending this hour with us. I did want to announce that um, we have quite a big week actually coming up on Design and Dialogue because we have on Wednesday, no less than Lee Edelcourt joining us, the great trend forecaster, design visionary. Um, and so she's gonna be um, coming on the program to reflect on recent, recent events and hazard some guesses as to what the near future and maybe distant futures may hold for us. So please come back to hear from Lee Edelcourt on Wednesday. And then on Friday, we have a fantastic new um, development on design and dialogue, which is that Stephen Burks, the designer, uh, here in New York will be taking on the role of uh, an additional host in the program. So from now on, Stephen and I are going to actually alternate as hosts here. And Stephen's going to be reaching out um, to his own network and folks that he's interested in talking to and bringing them onto the program. So we really welcome Stephen uh, to the show and please join us on Friday to hear him speak to Annie Archibong, who actually already spoke to us in the wake of the um, Black Lives Matter uh, protests uh, last month and is now going to be coming back on to teach uh, us something about his own work and speak to um, speak to Stephen about that. So that's going to be a really, I think, important initiative and I hope that people will be able to join in and hear from Stephen and his guests uh, coming up in the weeks and months to follow. And uh, that's all for today. Uh, Gus, thanks again. You started the conversation by saying how fortunate you were to be at the VNA, and I can say that they are likewise very fortunate indeed to have you. Boy, are you the right man for the right place at the right time. So it's great oh, to see. You're very kind, Glenn, and thank you all so much for, uh, for, for tuning in today. It's lovely to be in touch, and come and see us. Yeah, do you have any guesses as to when, the, um, when these uh, institutions, these new edifices will be open to the public? I know it's very- 2023 for the, um, for the, uh, collection center god willing and <laughs> what the following year um uh for the the museum but um if you get down that whole area is being transformed so lots to see before that and come and see us at the vna there's always lots to see in south ken was that ever true <laughs> you won't run out of things to see at the vna that's for sure <laughs> okay thanks again and uh, see you all on wednesday for lee edelcourt thanks gus so much thank you so much thank you okay.